Okay, I believe we are all here in one form or another. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce um, the next session, which is a very uh, fascinating topic that I think everyone's going to enjoy. Uh, we have a great group of panelists and a very uh, talented moderator uh, to join us and present our panelists to us. But um, and he'll explain the topic in more detail. But the the essential idea of the conversation for the next hour is the idea of what happens when a corporate sponsor comes into an open source project or a free software project and sponsors developers, maybe pays their salary to work on the project. But then what happens if that same sponsor decides to start producing software under a non-free software license? Um, and what issues does that raise? Um, what can we do about it? What's worked? What hasn't? And so it's my pleasure to introduce our esteemed panelists for today. Um, first, I'd like to introduce Karen Sandler, who's the Executive Director of Software Freedom Conservancy. She is well known uh, in the tech world as a cyborg lawyer for her advocacy for free software as a life or death issue, particularly in relation to software on medical devices. Next, we have Bruce Perens, who's uh, very well known as the second Debian project leader and more importantly, perhaps, as the principal author of the Debian Social Contract and the Debian Free Software Guidelines, which evolved into something that most people have heard of called the open source definition. He's also the co-founder of the Software and the Public Interest organization as well. Next up, we've got Andre Rebentisch from the Foundation for a Free Information Infrastructure. He's an expert in European digital regulatory affairs. And when he's not busy doing that, his day job is working at a German telecommunications company. Next, we've got Harris Pillay from Red Hat, uh, based in Singapore, a very well-known uh, face around the FOSS Asia conferences from year to year, a FOSS advocate, and ex has a lot of experience in the internet security and development, a tech ethicist, and an internet pioneer. We're very happy to have him in our conversation. And then finally, our moderator for the panel, I'm very pleased to introduce Roland Turner, who's the Chief Privacy Officer for TrustSphere, Trust Sphere, a member of the FOSS Asia organizing team that we've seen for many years around the events, and a founding member of Hackerspace SG. Uh, the Singapore's premier hackerspace. So, Roland, we'll turn it over to you to introduce the topic a little bit more and start the conversation. Take it away. Thank you, Michael. So, uh, as with most questions I asked, this one's going to be a bit big. Uh, the, the motivating event was the recent decision by Elastic to change the license under which they make the source code to Elasticsearch available. Uh, this is not any uh, grievance with Elastic. It is a sort of fundamental precept of free and open source software that the people who write the code write the rules. It's, it's, it's your intellectual property to do with as you wish, even if you object to that term. It is still the case that as the author of the code, you get to decide uh, under what terms it's made public. However, there are clearly concerns for the free and open source communities at large when something like that happens, particularly with something that's widely used and widely dependent upon. And so th there are a few prior examples that we'll touch on later in the panel. So the question that I want to ask, I have a horrible feeling we won't get to answer it because my panelists have some really amazing ideas that are a bit broader than my question. But the question that I want to ask is, what is it that should happen when an organization uh, makes this choice with respect to a piece of software that it publishers and that many people depend upon, uh, what should happen in the community at large, and indeed what can be done perhaps to mitigate the impact or indeed reduce the likelihood the likelihood of such things occurring in the future. So those, those are my, my broad questions, but my, 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 sorry, specific questions. My broader interest, like everything else I've ever spoken at FOSS Asia about, and the fact that I'm a ham radio operator, and that I work in privacy, and that I work with makerspaces and hackerspaces, all stem from a fundamental discomfort about the power imbalance between institutions, not just corporations, but corporations in particular, and individuals. So I'm perfectly happy for the conversation to be a bit broader uh, and to deal with these concerns, but I would love to have to make some progress on the, uh, the motivating question for the session, if we can. So what I'll do uh, is open with uh, an initial question to each of the panelists, carefully calculated to help them talk about the things they particularly want to talk about. Um, and then the rest of the session, we're rolling Q&A, including ongoing invitation to questions for the, from, the, uh, from the audience. 
I mean, I'll start with you. Um, the, in our exchange in advance, you expressed a concern that uh, the, the, our focus should perhaps be broader than just licenses, that there's a bunch of other concerns that we can and perhaps shouldn't be concerning ourselves with. Uh, do you want to sort of address that? A few minutes. Oh. Oh. Uh, yeah, I would like to. Oh, uh, sorry, and, and how it bears on my question, please. I'm perfectly happy to have my question answered. But I <laughs> sort of open. Here's the. Here's the. Please tell us what's concerning you. Where you're coming from? Right. Uh, I'm very much interested in the larger pictures. And while now licensing under uh, free and open source licenses is mainstream, it's like the default choice in many parts of the industry. Still, it does not always translate into degrees of freedom. And I know that say, free software dogmatics, they can then uh, quote like the four freedoms, but the question is really, um, does it match the contemporary struggles when it comes to liberties, um, even of developers? I mean, lots of developers, what are they struggling with? They're struggling with like these app store reviews um, of, their, of their little apps, the tight controls uh, exercised by these gated uh, stores, uh, certificates you need to buy, and well, uh, as a dogmatist, you can say, yeah, throw away the smartphone, but uh, not everyone wants to do that. Um, and rather, the app stores say, throw away your Electron apps. We don't want uh, Electron's apps here. So um, where are your, fr your freedoms then? And the platform, everything is open source or uh, free software. And uh, still, you don't have access to it. You cannot use uh, your own software on your device. And there are areas uh, like car electronics where maybe there are also good regulatory reasons not to enable you to tinker with your uh, self-driving cars. But still, uh, these are like the struggles ahead. And um, on the political side, say on the European level, there was this great discussion on uh, export controls for software. Um, think of spy tools like uh, the ones used by Finn Fisher, which were very prominent in the Arab Spring. Um, yeah, open sourcing them would not solve anything or the fundamental problem. And you already mentioned the privacy debate. Uh, was, yeah, where we now have commercial models um, of smart devices, smartphones, based on what critics call surveillance capitalism, um, where even all sorts of media consumption of users is being monitored. Um, and add to that also, uh, as a contemporary debate, the whole Me Too question of uh, sexually predatory behavior in the workplace, uh, female IT professionals that struggle with their freedom to code, uh, to gather the proper respect and uh, behavior in the workplace. Yeah, and of course, uh, always and ever uh, commercial viability, the elephant in the room was already um, put on the state, it's elastic search now. And yeah, um, also the conditions to think about where like these original free software um, concept uh, emerged from, uh, say, privileged environment in academia, where you have um, yeah um, persons in operations uh, that that already get their paycheck and don't have to struggle for their everyday living conditions. And while free and open source software, they bring a say, standardization of uh, licensing conditions, and we very much appreciate this. It's also surprising that the whole idea of, say, source code disclosure in general did not take up or now maybe even receives less traction. I mean, think of um, the debates around shared source policy. Uh, um, but say for a company like Microsoft, it wouldn't be rational um, at this stage um, to, say, open source or turn into free software, their, their cash cow products like Microsoft Office or Outlook, um, which would, would make sense for, for other reasons. And we also have like the trade debate now where we have, uh, they're like in these e-commerce chapters, uh, provisions against source code disclosure, um, mandatory source code trans, uh, disclosure by the state, which maybe is a very good idea, but yeah, still um, uh, we have like these okay. uh, provisions against it. A good, a good survey of the, the broader concern, and I hope we'll, uh, we'll dig further into uh, interventions that are broader than just uh, uh, license language. Because I, yes, I think that you've said it quite well that the I really dislike the term privilege because it tends to be pejorative, but certainly the very fortunate group 
uh, who gave rise to free software and later to, to open source um, necessarily aren't suffering the same concerns as you know, half to two thirds of humanity. So there is a, uh, I think, scope to, to broaden that. Uh, Karen, I had a perhaps a, a more concrete question for you on something other than licensing, but still loyally. So I, I quite like your uh, uh, the thing you're working on, which I must confess I hadn't actually heard of. Uh, so please talk a bit about it. Again, just a few minutes to get us, us the audience a sense of where you're coming from. Uh, we can't do it full justice here, but please. I, I want what, to, what, what but. I want to, but I, I have to talk about, I have to answer the bigger question first. I hope that's okay. And I, I want to tie it into what Andre said, which is, um, you know, I think that um, traditionally participants in the free and open source software communities have had a lot of privilege. They've had a lot of power. Um, and, um, and I think the promise of software freedom was that we were going to democratize technology, right? Like what, but software freedom was going to give people the opportunity to customize software wherever they were and to wherever they are to make it, you know, uh, I could customize the software for my heart device so that it would be okay to be pregnant with a heart device, right? Like the promise of software freedom is that we have that that power and that we're going to bring that to everyone. But in actuality, we haven't necessarily done that. Software freedom hasn't necessarily democratized technology. And part of the reason why we haven't done that is that those of us with our privilege have not leveraged our privilege enough in order to make sure that what you described never happens. And we can make sure that it never happens if every free and open source software developer that has the power to do so insists on certain things in the project and the technology that they contribute to. And that goes across the board. One is, you know, copy left really goes a long way in this. There's, you know, there are a lot of, um, you know, details to that, but um, but copyleft, certainly strong copyleft license really helps. Um, making sure that a project has good governance from the outset, that there's a real level playing field. Um, if you like avoid aggregating copyrights because a company that doesn't have all the copyrights can't pivot with their license in the same way. And if you must aggregate your licenses, you know, then then do so in a nonprofit that reflects that good governance that you established earlier. Um, you know, so so there are all of these ways that we can help keep companies in check, and we should. We also should take a much more holistic approach, um, like Andre is suggesting, and that's one of the reasons why I co-authored a declaration of digital autonomy with Molly DeBlanc, um, which is just a first draft, but I'll drop the link in the chat for anyone who's interested. We're taking feedback now, um, where we we must, you know, talk about how all of these like software freedom is necessary, but it is not sufficient. Um, so, you know, I think there are all of these ways we should never allow ourselves to be in this position because we have the power to make sure that companies behave in a way that we find acceptable. And where we've been able to exercise that power, we've avoided some of these worst case scenarios. Now, another way that I think that we can leverage that privileges on an individual basis and that's what Roland has tipped me off to say which is that I'm I'm working on a, an initiative to help developers better under contributors better understand their employment agreements because when you're on their way into a company you have an opportunity to negotiate that agreement a lot of people don't know that and when you do you can put things in your agreement like I you know as part of my job I will be working on free and open source software only um, or um, I get to keep the copyrights of my contributions um, it could also be much smaller than that, like I get keep the copy, I, I own the things that I work on outside of my employment, which unfortunately is not the case everywhere. Um, and so these agreements are almost always somewhat negotiable and people don't know that. And so um, contract patch is an initiative where we're literally writing patches that you can ask for in your employment agreement, but also just to help people better understand those agreements. Um, so that they can negotiate it. And while we're in the process and haven't published anything yet, um, I have lost count of the number of developers who have said that they have managed to get all of the things I just named in their employment agreement. Not everyone has gotten everything, but um, but many have gotten multiple um, uh, uh, provisions included. So that's really encouraging. I, I think it's brilliant. And, and I suspect, for reasons that I hope to get back to during this panel, that you may have picked up on something much larger than you realized. Uh, the Western society has been here before, and the consequences were spectacular. So I, I think there's reason to push that. Software licensing might all, almost end up being a footnote compared to the consequences of, of what you're describing. Uh, Bruce, 
uh, you are pursuing something quite ambitious, uh, one might even say heretical, um, and we simply don't have time to do it justice properly here, but I, I would invite you to express at least two things that I think might help the, the panel and audience understand where you're coming from. Uh, the first was in an email to me, you offered a, a resource extraction metaphor that for me immediately transformed how I understand what you're working on. I, I got it in one go. Um, but secondly, you might, high, very high level, just describe the thing that you are uh, promoting. We'll get back to some of the details, but again, take three or four minutes now to, for, I'd suggest for those two things. Well, let's talk about the resource extraction thing, because I, I don't think the audience understood that. And what that is, is the way that business approaches open source is from the paradigm of a resource extraction company. So these would be companies that mine or cut down the woods to make lumber, etc. So they have a public resource, it's not one that they own, which they harvest, and they do the PR. So you'll notice that, uh, for example, the Linux Foundation is pretty much the main entity speaking for open source. And when I look at the list of the steering board of that organization, I see the most exploitive companies of open source steering the organization, some of whom uh, were, for example, uh, infringers of open source licenses, um, some of whom actually work against the open source community in government and standards. Um, uh, for example, the Qualcomm guy who's on the uh, Linux Foundation board works for royalty bearing patents in standards when people like myself, others uh, from the open source initiative are representing open source or attempting to on the same organization and, and saying we need standards that don't have patent royalties in them. So there's this big tension. And so we need to stop the loggers speaking for the trees. Okay, we're the trees and those companies are the loggers. Now, the other thing I want to talk about is let's evaluate our mission achievement. And Karen sort of touched on this when she said, you know, we don't serve the average person. We really don't. We don't fulfill their needs. We have not liberated them from these exploitive companies, etc. What we have done is we have achieved the goals of business for open source. We have not achieved the goals of people. We have not served the people except for maybe 5% in all the world. And from that perspective, open source is a failure. And, and when I say open source, free software, open source, same thing. And um, so I, I think that we've done a great job for the business world, but we need to pivot. and. One thing we should be considering is the initial announcement of the GNU project went out on Usenet. There was no internet. I was at work and I read it. This was in, in September of 1983. So we've been working on the same thing for 37 years. And we should have learned more by now. Consider there were no cell phones. A car phone took up most of your trunk. Um, the, the most complicated input device in most people's homes was either a dial or a touch tone pad. Um, there was no, you could not have thought about Amazon eating the lunch of elastic. And we are still working with the paradigm of 37 years ago. And we need to consider, well, what were our goals? back then and why are we not achieving them and what comes after open source because maybe it's time for something to come out after open source and free software and that doesn't mean we abandon them 
what we do is we preserve them and we preserve the promises of free software and open source as they exist today. And we provide those developers a way to transition through dual licensing into a paradigm that doesn't have Amazon eating your lunch, that gives freedom and free software to the people we most need to serve, who are individuals, not the richest companies in the world, that sometimes charges the deep pocket companies for things, and that also charges for some abusive uses. For example, embedding our software in digital rights management and performing our software as a service without adding additional value. These are the abusive uses, and some of those developers should be paid for them. And if they were paid for them, they could focus more on helping the average person because they'd have the money and the time to work on the average person's needs and the motivation. And that doesn't exist right now either. We mostly write software for each other rather than for everyone else in the world. So I have a paradigm I'm working on. It's called Post Open. And there's a program on YouTube under my name. Uh, it's just the first let's, step. Let's come back to concrete steps in mitigations. I think the I, I stage is the rest of your panel. Say again? I can again? talk for the entire rest of well, your I, panel. I, I, I know. <laughs> and, then, and as I said, even before I had approached all four of you, I had enough questions to operate for hours. So we, we will have plenty to cover. But, but I do specifically want to get into mitigations. So I will come back to you on some perhaps more concrete details of what you have in mind uh, later in the panel. Um, Harish, uh, you have the distinction of being the, the only panelist who is has not turned up with a specific uh, program of change to uh, propose, but you also have a very long involvement in uh, corporate engagement with open source software, and particularly uh, within Red Hat. And I, I understand you're not speaking on behalf of Red Hat today. Um, where would you like, you've got a lot of white noise in the background. Um, okay, I'm not sure what I can do about it, but let me... <laughs> oh, that improved it. Yes, that, that's better. Is it better? Is it better? Well, okay. it was. <laughs> no matter. Okay. okay. Address whichever piece you like, including my question or not, as you wish. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> can you remind me what your question was now? So I'm confused of which one I attacked. <laughs> okay, so what, the question that went about the panel was sort of what sort of things should happen. I don't mean what should Elastic do or what should Amazon do or what should anyone else do, but in terms of a, how we would like to see what are essentially economic relations um, uh, happen in the event that a major contributor to open source or to one major project decides to cease. We accept the right that they have the right to do so, but what should happen in the rest of the community to perhaps deal with that and perhaps what should happen to reduce the likelihood of future changes or to mitigate their effect. Yeah, thanks. Um, but also, anything else the best book about? Sure. Yeah, there, there, there's a lot to, you know, the, you know, the three predecessors, uh, they have spoken quite a bit about it anyways. Um, I, I guess I'm in a, in a, in a place with, an, with a group of people and with a business that uh, is sort of smack in the middle of a lot of the things that is happening. And what we are trying to navigate is the choppy seas of, uh, you know, uh, different pulls and pulls of uh, pushes and pulls of uh, interest, and trying to be as honest and true to the open source ideals, everything that we do to be uh, staying on track. Because uh, so so if I take Elastic as an example, as a uh, as a something to talk about, uh, the the challenge with any of these things at the end of the day is that a dependency grows up in a particular set of technologies and the dependency is now based on as opposed to uh, there are two, two types of projects so one is like a, an example of open ssl open ssl was essentially a project you know a, a few people initially started it grew up and got in a lot more people 
and then started to you know uh, peter out because he reached a level of stability and everything was happy until something happened then everybody scrambled try to figure out and make something happen now there wasn't a corporate entity behind it from that perspective so that's one type of a project the other one is elastic and all those who have done the same kind of uh, twist and turn in terms of uh, licensing and SSPL and so on. Um, so there is this sense that when something becomes too large, in, no matter whether it's a proprietary company or a, uh, open source project, it becomes too large to fail, that's when we have a problem. And I think that's where we are in some of these projects because they are both a project and a culprit entity. And that's part of the bigger problem. And uh, so from a Red Hat point of view, uh, speaking as a Red Hat, uh, not necessarily speaking for Red Hat, uh, we face this every single day. How do we make sure we are always honest to the goals, to the four freedoms of, uh, of, of FSF, and yet try to generate a business that is accountable to the customer? So it's, it's, a, it's a very, very fine line. And it's not easy. I got no easy answers to this. It's a lot of work, a lot of effort, a lot of understanding and talking to people. And then there will be those who come with a, a what about this, a what about that. Uh, that distracts everything. Let's focus on what we're trying to achieve and, and move forward in that direction. Yes. Yeah, what about some, I cannot handle what about this. I walk away from that. I highlight it to them. That's not what we're talking about. Let's talk about just specifically this. How do we do this? And are we doing it to the extent that we claim that we are doing? And what everybody in general agrees, yeah, that's about right. Uh, and everybody can see well and say, yeah, you're being honest about it. Uh, the, the, the model works well for companies that are committed. Uh, and, uh, but the fear is, of course, that uh, most aren't. And even those who, have, who start out sometimes change their minds, uh, as we've seen, which is legitimate. Uh, yes, I, thank you. I hadn't thought about applying the too big to fail uh, metaphor, but that of course is exactly why it's a concern. That they, once yeah. someone gets big enough, the, the fact that they have the power to make the change gives them leverage over people that you might reasonably regard as unjust, even though their individual choices are perfectly legitimate. So that's, that's an intriguing problem. All right, so now I'm going to address the audience for a moment. Uh, this is a 55 minute session. Uh, a lot of other sessions tend to run for sort of 50 or 50. 45 minutes and then have a sort of Q&A uh, session jammed on the end. Uh, one of the joys in running a conversational panel is we don't have to do that and therefore we're not going to do it. Uh, audience <laughs> Q&A starts now and now. runs for the next uh, 29 minutes, right up until the end of the panel, which is 29 minutes from now. So uh, what I am going to do is maintain some sort of nominal agenda and to spend roughly 10 minutes each on the objectives or the values that we're pursuing, the risks that we are concerned about, uh, and then finally, the, the mitigations, the measures that we might take to uh, to strengthen it. What I'll try to do is give more, reserve more time for the latter, because I know that uh, Karen and Bruce in particular have quite substantial things to say on the, uh, on the latter. So, um, look, my first question then is, is really, it's a follow on from the, the opening, where are you coming at this from? It is, what are the values or the objectives that, that you see as important for free software, open source software, or indeed uh, post-open software? Uh, Karen. You caught me while I was taking a screenshot to show off that we're having this awesome panel. <laughs> um, so hit me again with the question. I was just about to comment on how great you're doing moderating. So. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you just like push one button to take a screenshot? Um, the uh, so this is the, the the first of the three sort of general phases I want to take the panel through is, is objectives and values rather than specific risks and specific mitigations. What what is it? What are the good things that we're here about? And and I'm hoping this is slightly more concrete than the than the opening statements. What where do you concretely measure if we can? What do you think we would like to achieve in the next year, five years, 10 years, whatever? Yeah, I mean, I think that like we're at this inflection point in the free and open source software community where we realize we, we, we are, are, are seeing our early successes wane and we are wondering why we have not succeeded as much since then. And I think, um, I think that a lot of it has to do with the fact that um, 
I, I don't know how to put this in a in a in a super nice way, which makes me feel a little uncomfortable. But I feel like a lot of people who were passionate about software freedom saw the you know saw the promise of it were were people who contributed as hobbyists and as idealists, and then they got jobs and they were um, were in this and happy spot. Bunches. Yeah, yeah, and we're in this happy spot where they felt like they could work on the thing they cared about and get a good salary and get paid on it and still push forward the thing that they cared about. And what happened is, is that so many of those people wound up making small compromises over time um, and, and, and didn't recognize the fact that the interests of their paycheck were not necessarily the interests of the ideology. And I think we're now at the point where it's simply plain that we can't reconcile those two things all of the time. Like it, we could so never can say, have. Can you say concretely then, which uh, some objectives that we might uh, sort of lift back out of the mud and, and uh, rethink our compromises on or abandon them? Yeah, we need to go right back to ideology. Like people talk about sustaining open source, but I have never, and it's important that people be able to survive and it's important that maintainers be able to um, to stay focused and um, and make a salary. I, I agree with those points, but ideology as sustainability is extremely powerful when people know. So at Conservancy, we, um, we hire dozens of developers um, to work on our member projects um, every year. And then we also hire, um, you know, around 100 interns every year to work on outreachy projects. Um, and having people who are paid through a charitable nonprofit to work on their free software project is a really powerful thing because the interests that those developers or those contributors, because they're not all developers, are working for and the ends that they're working for are in the public good. And because they're being paid through a charity, they can't make as much money as they might make through a corporate actor. But the roadmap that they're working on is established by everyone. And it is to make the use of that technology better over time for all. And so it's a, it's a different way that we can start thinking about it. And I, I'm, you know, I, I'm proud that we've been doing that within Conservancy. Um, I think we mentioned a whole bunch of things that, um, that I'm working on that are very pragmatic. There's, um, you know, there's contract patch. There's also, um, you know, ethical organizations. You know, I think it's been very powerful to see what's happened at Google with their organizing. And, um, and I think that, um, you know, when I was in college, I was uh, sworn into the Order of the Engineer, which is a, um, it's actually, it was started in, in Canada, but uh, I, I went to uh, undergrad in the United States. But uh, but I, I swore that I had an I understood that I had an ethical obligation in my engineering work, and that lives were at stake. Um, and I, I think that if we had ethical societies, ethical obligations, if we thought about the ultimate, you know, and I'm talking in platitudes again. So you asked me not to do that. No, oh, but but I th actually, I think you've stated something. Uh, quite concrete, it's sort of in the in the verbiage, which was that it is specifically desirable that we have a larger, ideally much larger number of people who are working on stuff that is explicitly ideological, mission-based. There's a few different ways it can be stated, and that their income is structured around pursuing that objective rather than. The, the sort of investment machine mechanism that uh, typically venture backed but probably for profit corporations are built to, to do. I think that's a really, I hadn't thought of it in quite those terms, but that's a really important yeah. answer. But rather than letting and it be you, something that happens along the side, make, do it more of it. And you, <laughs> might, you might make less money to do that, but it serves the public good and it's easier to sustain over the long run. You're not raising as much money and then you're also broadening the base. So, you know, you're, I always say, you know, like see where the money's coming from, right? You look at all of these organizations, I, I put in the chat, the, um, the IRS search uh, entity to take a look at where the money is coming from in these organizations and how it flows. And you can see that organizations that are, um, you know, are, are set up around this kind of model have really good, you know, public support. They are getting small donations from a lot of individuals and it's, it looks different. The motivation is different. And if we can employ a lot more developers in this mechanism, we'll start to see some really interesting things.
I love people suggesting things I had never even thought of. This is fantastic. <laughs> it's, uh, Andre, what, uh, I, I, again, I'm asking more about objectives than, than mechanisms at this time, although to the extent that they're inseparable, it's fine. Uh, I, like, what are the values that you want to see elevated or the objectives you'd like to see pursued over the next, let's say, the next decade? Yeah, I, I'm afraid I cannot compete with uh, loggers and trees. That, that's a wonderful metaphor. And also Karen shared a nice manifesto. Of course, there are lots of manifestos, and I think there should be a thousand flowers of uh, ideas that people bring forward, and there cannot be a fixed catalog. Um, so let me share a kind of positive view or a positive perspective. And uh, yeah, I'm trying to bring up an iceberg, <laughs> um, a positive one, not the one that struck the Titanic. Um, and I would like to stress that the focus on fossilizing conditions is sometimes a bit of a, a tip of an iceberg. And when we consider the larger, the unregulated, the non-codified ecosystem that characterizes typical um, free and open source software development environments, um, we, get, we get lots of things that were not regulated, that were not prescribed. For instance, very simple example, licenses as such do not specify that you ought to have a public bug tracker. Um, I'm working in a commercial um, software company. Yes, we have support, but we don't have a public bug tracker that anyone on the internet can read. And licenses do not specify that anyone can download the code. Yeah, even free software licenses, they don't say you can download everything from the internet. It just happens. Um, or even check out the several, code history. Several, several provided as an option, as an alternative to uh, providing to licensees, but yes, very few are saying. What, what was it? In the, yeah, that you can. Uh, was originally it was more in the GPL, even more this shareware model. You can, uh, yeah, get some. <laughs> some uh, so so the, just, the GPL yeah. requirement initially was that you had to either provide the source to yeah. licensees or provide a binding offer to provide it on request, yeah. which, which mattered when it was CDs being mailed around. Or uh, even but as a print out, like, yeah. <laughs> Oh, indeed. Later licenses, possibly including GPL3, uh, a number of them specifically talk about uh, it's it's a adequate uh, discharge of the obligation to make the thing readily available in a public place via conventional means for download. Those kinds of words. So, but it, you're right. It's only a couple of licenses that do that. It's not uh, universal. So, if I'm hearing you, I, I, the um, what you'd like to see, quite apart from mechanism is that uh, by one means or another, the, the kinds of things that look that all look and feel to us like a well-run project, that we can find the people, the documentation, the bug tracker, the source code and source history, the design documentation, the, uh, the, the on-ramping for beginners with simple bugs, all that stuff, that there is, this is a worthwhile thing that we should seek to promote somehow. How we do is a separate question. But that, is that the, a reasonable paraphrase? Yeah, I would say even where um, um, companies move back from the uh, more restrictive uh, to more restrictive licensing model, often this kind of open development environment remains. And um, it's not prescribed. Of course, you can also do free software in a different environment. It just naturally emerges that you have this openness, that you have uh, mailing lists, that you have uh, contacts, that you have forums, et cetera, et cetera, um, especially when the, when the code gets free. Sure. And uh, if I just go back to this uh, Elasticsearch uh, issue, they're, uh, of course, they, they're changing the licensing model now for commercial reasons. But um, I mean, forks are in discussion. Uh, I know at least uh, that was discussion to put it in the Apache Foundation or the CNCF. Um, More than discussion. Uh, Amazon has done it. Fork, you know. <laughs> and uh, maybe maybe um, other organizations would emerge, say, the free elastic, free Free Elastic, Free Elastic Foundation. And uh, in, in Berlin, uh, we have the Document Foundation that took LibreOffice, although the Apache Foundation already had uh, taken over OpenOffice um, under the stewardship, I think, mostly of IBM. So um, we have these very successful models. But of course, there's a way, there's a discussion about making money uh, with open source uh, to have something um, sustainable. But uh, in the case of Elastic, it's like, uh, I think uh, 430 million uh, per year annual business. So uh, with four or five million, you can set up a very nice uh, 
a very nice business case for a, for a foundation that continues under a legacy license. So I, I um, think you've 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 been you've come up with something quite clever. That in the same sense that some licenses oblige uh, public disclosure of source upfront, there's also it's not quite clear how to say it or how to do it, and even whether licensing is the right tool. But also this. Um, it should not be the case that a, that a licensee, can, particularly a for-profit licensee, can comply by doing a periodic uh, and somewhat obscure source dump. Go back 20 odd years, uh, IBM's Java CC, uh, they got dinged because they were publishing Java code for their Java compiler compiler, but the Java code was not source code. It was machine generated from a high level language, the compiler for which they were not publishing. And so here's our open source Java compiler compiler, but you can't modify it, or you can, but we're just going to trample it with our next uh, updates. And this is what GNU GPL calls the preferred form for making modifications. IBM hadn't uh, shared. So it's a, a broader form of just the same uh, observation that if we can establish norms, maybe even licensing obligations, to ensure that the the community can't be have the the, the rug yanked out from underneath it which is the usual shape of it, where the corporation has all the developers, the main contributors on payroll, then we limit the harm. And I, su I suspect, therefore, limit the temptation. So it's, it, it works both ways. Bruce, uh, you actually listed a number of obligations. I didn't quickly note them uh, while, while you, uh, a number of ob objectives, rather. Uh, I didn't quickly list them, but I um, get to remind us. I'm sorry, I didn't get the question at all. Oh, sorry. So um, this this sort of phase, I'm, I'm trying to get a, a sense of what the values are, either, either broad values or concrete objectives. Uh, oh, okay. To, to pursue. And, and I know a number came up in your opening comments, so perhaps you could remind us. Oh, okay. Or, so or we, first, stand, hold on. we need to serve the normal person out on the street, you know, who's not a hacker. And so far, we've really failed at that. And I think that it's fundamental to serving that person that the people who serve them have some way of supporting themselves and feeding their families and making free software. And obviously, we don't want to say, well, here, little guy, you have to pay for the software so that I can feed my family. We want to give those folks freedom. However, when you've got the biggest, most hungry, deepest pocket companies who are making money from free software, I mean, everybody builds their infrastructure on free software. I think there should be a couple goals where they're concerned. First is that they be able to use the software. Second is that compliance be much easier. If you've actually done open source compliance in a company, it is a nightmare today. And what I would like it to be is that you write a check once a year and you send it off. And that is compliance. And well, how do we do that? Well, we can tell what software you're using. We can do that technically. You don't really have to tell us. You can run a program, and it will tell us. And we can, using that, divvy up that check that you've sent among the developers whose software that you're using, and do that for very many people. Now, what should we charge? This is all stuff I'm still working on. But what I'm thinking is that if you collect funds from an end user using the software, you should pay 1% of those funds. And that 1% goes for all of the software that's under the post open license. And the way it works is if you're an open source developer and you do a license under this license, and there's other software that's only under the post open license. The license choice is made for post open for all of that software. And the result is that companies have to pay the open source developer, even though the software is still available under an open source license, if they also want to use the post open software. 
And so there's some getting over the hump where this is concerned, because obviously you have to have enough software that it becomes desirable for business to buy into this covenant. Um, now, I've but been in the film we've, business. We've had variants of this before with, with dual licensing, yeah. that there are ways to, to facilitate that. It says, you know, there's, there's a very real value there that you've brought up that I hadn't thought about, which is compliance. That if you're able to solve the problem or a large chunk of the problem for corporate compliance people, that's real direct monetary value. Uh, and so they, they would pay real money to not have that problem. Yes. And potentially yeah. the money that I'm talking about. I mean, I have been for 20 years a consultant in this area, and I, I build seven and a half dollars per minute working on this for people. So it is expensive. And um, so another thing that I would do is there are two kinds of what, what I'd say are pernicious uses. And one is where you perform the software and you don't add value. And the other is digital rights management. Mm -hmm. Those two would not be 1%, they would be 10%. And once you pay, you can integrate with proprietary software. So the biggest thing that these companies want to do, which is to have their own differentiating value protected, they can do. And we need to think about um, the exchange of value. How do you exchange value in the free software community? You improve the software. Thus, you are exchanging software for software. There are some people who don't want to exchange software for software. Let's give them the chance to exchange money for software, and that will pay us to make more software that we can exchange with the other folks. So, so you, you pulled out a few things. I apologize, we're down to nine minutes. God, time flies. Um, there's the uh, a really big one, which is that we, as a community, need to be serving people on the street who aren't coders. We've, we've monumentally failed to do that. And for that, in that for that reason, we are merely riding on the back of software in the world. We haven't really thrived as a body of people that serve society. Although, so we, I'm we 63 today. I would like, before I die, to see the free software community serving the average person. I, I think that's a reasonable goal for the rest of my life. I think that's a fair goal for most of us. The other, there's a bunch of others there that I will refer to, well, later on blog posts, I suspect. But the other big one that you've called out that I hadn't thought about in quite those terms is to help corporations or to allow corporations using free and open source software to sustain the separation of their uh, differentiating efforts, the efforts that differentiate them in the eyes of their customers. And this, this dovetails nicely with the observation that what free and open source software are really good at, have really excelled at, is the non-differentiating element of technology that's used in the back room, the servers, uh, to to plumb everything, not, rather than the piece that, that customers can see and buy on the basis of. So, so if I think you it's a want really... to understand this, read my paper, The Emerging Economic Paradigm of Open Source. It's 14 years old now. Emergence is an ongoing task. Uh, we're now down to eight minutes. Harish. Um, particular values or objectives that you see as important over the next decade or two, the rest of your life, if you wish. I think that's a, that's a reasonable planning scope. And you're muted. Yeah, I, I would echo what Bruce is saying. You know, I, I would love to see us uh, do this as a, you know, as a societal objective, that everybody benefits from it. But it, it does, there, there's this uh, nagging thing in the back of my mind, uh, which uh, was something that I read many, many years ago. Uh, and the title of that was called I Pencil. It's basically a pencil telling the story of how it was created and how none of us on this panel, and I don't think any one of us that is watching this, knows how to make a pencil. What goes on to make a pencil? The wood, the graph, it's uh, and, and the furu and the rubber and the ink and whatever that needs to go in to make a pencil. So likewise, the software and everything that we depend on is built by somebody else, just just how it is. 
But if I don't have a means to have some sense of understanding and ability to navigate that space and also to be able to figure out uh, how can I contribute? This is the real problem because every time I have conversations with people, uh, not necessarily from the IT industry, uh, they ask me about software. They say, oh, you're from the IT industry. Can you fix my computer? Why is it that they can't do that? Why is it that they, they, there's this huge block? No, I don't know what to do. It's not mine. Uh, it, somebody else do it for me. Right? So that's where the problem is. STEM problem. Yeah, I, I get the. I get that one. Unbelievably, we're down to six minutes. Uh, so <laughs> I, I do want to get into mechanism, and I have a specific question for Karen. Uh, Jonas, do you mind turning off your camera, please? Jonas, thank you. Hi, Jonas. Uh, but I did invite, and we have received questions from the audience. So uh, Michael's question actually is related to my question to Karen. Um, just an open one to the panel, <coughs> a sort of social observation. In Thailand, having political parties involved in FOSS seems to court controversy as there is a stigma associated with political parties and politicians. Uh, is that the case in other parts of the world? Uh, any panelist, do you want to take that one? Come on, Harish. You know you want to talk about what would happen if PAP was running an open source program. <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, you want <laughs> no, it's it's fine. No, no, it's fine. I mean, uh, just just from a production perspective, I I ran in last year's Singapore general election in a, a different alternative party, um, and I did help with the current incumbent subsequently won the elections uh, before the elections in doing some stuff around the contact tracing app that we have for, on the mobile phone to make sure that that particular thing was open sourced. And it's available on GitHub. It's on a GPL version three license, so on and so on. So there, there isn't. A, uh, fortunately, there isn't any negative in, uh, connotation to doing stuff that way. At least not in Singapore. Uh, so I think that is a, a positive. So I would say, you know, for for the person who was asking the question, I think it's Mishari. Uh, yeah, I, I think we need to have a conversation. If there is a possibility to have a conversation with uh, the folks in Thailand who have this challenge. Thank you. Uh, finally. Uh, I'll ask a two-part question to Karen, and we're then pretty much out of time. Um, the question from our, in fact, our MC, Michael, uh, do we mere mortals as individual employees have any power in the equation as to what our employers ask to do with our open source work? And the, my half of the question was more to look at what happened during the late part of the Industrial Revolution when there was an unprecedented shortage of semi-skilled labor and that gave rise to labor unionism which then was the engine behind the largest change in human rights in human history uh, i'd suggest that it's probably too much to ask that programmers of the world unite and do the same thing again but it also occurs to me this might be quite as crazy as it sounds um <laughs> karen where are you on this admittedly grandiose of you <laughs> No, I'm right with you. Like, I, I, first of all, I think the moment that we're at right now is unprecedented, right? Like, I know, um, you know, we're talking about how uh, Bruce has mentioned quite a lot about how we are not serving um, regular people or, um, or you know, non-developers, and I think this is the first time in certainly in my lifetime that everyone understands what technology, like the importance of technology. This is like, after all these years of working in free and open source software, finally, those relatives that I see at my family functions are saying, you were really onto something. I thought you were really annoying, but it turns out that you made some really good points and I stopped using WhatsApp or I stopped, you know, I'm, I'm good, just, you know, I'm going off Facebook and, you know, I don't, I don't have the right answers right now for to say like here are your alternatives that are perfect substitutes that you are not substitutes but alternatives that you will embrace and enjoy and will serve your needs but we have an unprecedented opportunity to create those like the very fact that big blue button right now that we're on is so good and that I can easily provide alternatives to zoom for every single meeting that I am ever asked to do is a huge triumph and so I think we're at this real inflection point and I think that at the same time I think developers developers 
aren't realizing that there are consequences to the work that they're doing and that they have a responsibility to make sure that the technology they work on is not part of the problem and that they're not forwarding the dystopia that um, you know that we're fast finding ourselves in and so I think you know, I, 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 I don't think that it's too much to ask for us to start an ethical movement amongst developers. I, I know that um, that traditionally it's been um, extremely alienating to say, please make software freedom or the principles of open source software or whatever it is, however it is we want to talk about it, that it's been somewhat alienating. But now is the time because there is a real security argument for it. There is real, and, and it's tied into all these other issues. It's time for us to not be siloed anymore. And it's time for us to speak up for the ethical nature of our work and the way that software freedom fits into that. Software freedom, free and open source software is not necessarily better, safer, or more ethical, but it gives us a chance to be better, safer, and more ethical. And so I, I don't think it's, I think you're absolutely right, Roland, when you tie it to, um, to other labor movements. And I think this is our time and I think we can do it. Thank you, and I, I, I suspect that you're right. Uh, we have landed right on five minutes to the hour, at which point I am required to give the room back. Uh, Michael, are you still, uh, you still with us? While we wait for Michael to appear, a uh, huge thank you, all four of you. Uh, even despite the fact that I talked to each of you beforehand, this ground has covered, uh, this talk has, panel has covered ground that I hadn't anticipated, hadn't thought about. <laughs> it, it is great to have panelists who can think beyond what I can. Uh, Wait a minute. I've just been told that the MC is off duty and it's all me, which creates an interesting problem. Uh, which means well, that. Well, we, we could thank you, Roland. Thank you so much for moderating this panel. You were excellent. It was a really fun discussion. <laughs> My thank you, Roland. Ah. <laughs> you. And while I'm clicking up here, I just wanted to wait. Can you see uh, us? Can you hear us? Yes, yes. Loud, loud and clear. Loud and clear. Yes, I'm really thrilled to have uh, the panel here today, and I just want to express my appreciation to all the panelists. And I want to shout out to Ruth and Karen because it's difficult for you with the time zone, but you still uh, make the time to come here. I know for Karen it's only two in the morning. Thank you so much, and also for Ruth, very late in the evening. I really appreciate that you take your time to come and connect with the um, community in Asia. I don't know how how many. Thank you. I I should say, but I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. For, for making it even like the challenging of the time zone. And of course, Harris uh, and a very interesting conversation. Um, Jordan, thank you for putting it up. So I, we have everything recorded, we'll be online. I have, I have people asking already for the, for the video. I will share with them at the end of the day. So we release right at the end of the day. And then about uh, a week after the event, we have the video of this session. I will share, I will send it to your email as well. Thank you very much. Mario, any well, what can I else I can say? You already said all the thanks. Uh, <laughs> you understand that we definitely appreciate it, and it's a very important conversation. I think there are many more points to add, and we definitely need to continue in this exchange. Um, I think the important point was that uh, uh, free software and open source is like a lot dominated by some large companies, and even Red Hat brought up uh, uh, Harris brought up this point. And so, um, thank you very much. I think that's very important. Many other important points have been said. So, appreciate it and greetings. So, let's continue. Thank you. Please. One final comment to all four panelists. There were some questions in the shared notes section that we didn't quite get to. Uh, if you would like to spend a few minutes uh, peering at them, perhaps commenting, I, I think the uh, audience members might appreciate it.